Hey everybody, and welcome to this evening's MRAP Grand Rounds. We're doing our emergency medicine edition. We got a little bit of a different show for you tonight. If you're joining us from Instagram Live, thanks for coming on over. We're really excited to have you here. We got an amazing group of people. My name's Scott Kobner, and I'm joined, as always, by the incredibly lovely and brilliant Brit Guest. How are you doing, Brit? Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. Um, before we even dive into this show and how it's going to be a little different, a couple updates, and we're going to be at ASAP. Super, super excited to be there. Um, as maybe you've heard, we're putting on a three-hour uh, live show with our MRAP faculty. Uh, we're also going to have an MRAP booth, which I'm very excited about, spending a lot of time with our production team making this. We are going to bring the MRAP studio to Philly. We're going to basically have the booth as the MRAP studio. We're going to be de we're going to be doing procedures. We're going to be um, filming, recording and showing you guys basically the behind the scenes of how we make this magic happen. How the sausage is made. That's what we're going to do. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to bring the studio so far out there that we're not going to actually make anything for the next two months after that. We'll be bringing it all that. We're we also get vacation gonna... for two months? What? Yeah. <laughs> we're also going to have a uh, UC booth for those of you who might be joining us that follow from our UC rounds or our UC Max listeners. So that'll be fun too. And it'll just be a really great time. Britt's done an incredible job of planning this out. It's going to be really awesome. We're excited to see you there. Let's see, what else do we have on the docket? How is tonight a little bit different than our normal Grand Rounds? Well, normally we have a little bit of a variety show, which will be fun. And, you know, we decided tonight we're going to try doing something a little bit different, a little bit more controversial. We're going to dive into some deep clinical questions with our amazing faculty here and kind of poke at each other a little bit and seeing where our limits are and uh, how we practice clinical medicine a little bit and not be afraid to have some disagreements, of course, as supported by evidence and our own like anecdotal practices. Uh, and so feel free in the chat to drop any questions you have. We're going to be dropping a whole bunch of polls in there too. So your answers will help drive the discussion. We hope to make it as interactive and fun as possible. And as our usual disclaimer before the show starts, Please like, subscribe down below, hit the little bell notification. So whenever we do go live, we drop something new, you know about it. We just passed over 50,000 people. So that's whoop, whoop. really exciting for us. And we're really glad that you guys have been joining us on this journey. So who are we joined with tonight, Britt? Who's here with us? Well, we have two of my favorite people. We've got Dr. Sarah Kreger. Woohoo! Hey, girl. And we've got Dr. Mel Herbert. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. It's my first time on TV. <laughs> Is this thing on? All I right. think it's on. I think it's on. So <laughs> let's let's dive into it, Scott. What are these controversial topics? What, are, you, are we going to get into a brawl? Are we going to fight? Yeah, are we all... we, we've cleared out the studio space to just have a giant... <laughs> this is going to be a giant fight free for all here in a second. <laughs> no, we're all friends. Let's yep. do it. So we're going to start off with a discussion about post rosk whole body CTs. So there's a paper published um, in 2023 called the CT First Study. I'm sure you've heard some pieces maybe on MRAP already about it, some other things in the interwebs, the foam med space. Um, and I wanted to like paint the picture for you. Um, so this paper, the citation should be coming up. 2023, the idea is patients that suffer a non-traumatic out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, should they get a whole body CT as part of their standard emergency department care? Is that something that you guys are doing right now as a change of practice? Sarah, I'm going to jump to you first as our, uh, no, our intensivist. I have an opinion or two about this. Yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> so I've, I do. I think that most patients, if they had a cardiac arrest, I usually CT scan them. And it's partially, yes, am I looking for a big diagnosis that I have missed that would change my manager? Yeah. Do they have an aortic dissection? Do they have a big PE? But it's more than that. And it's it's a lot of what it is, is what I call Murphy's Law of Critical Care, which is the more things that have gone wrong, the more things that will go wrong. And so just because I've identified the cause of cardiac arrest, that doesn't mean I've identified everything life-threatening or wrong with the patient. And so we do a lot of things to people during cardiac arrest. We mash on their chest. If we're doing CPR right, we probably break some ribs. We can give them complications. We put in lines. We poke needles into them. All kinds of things can happen. So for me, it's not just about identifying diagnoses that were not obvious to me, because sometimes we're like, oh, sure, I know exactly why they arrested and really we have no idea. So that's part of it. But also it's about identifying post-arrest sequelae sooner rather than later. And to me, the big picture of why we should be doing this sooner rather than later in the ED is the other sort of half of my philosophy here, which is proactive, not reactive. When patients are this sick, they're super tenuous. You don't have a lot of room for error. You don't have a lot of room to maneuver. And so I think that trying to really figure out, is there a big cause of arrest that I'm missing, that I should do something about, 
And are there post-arrest sequelae that maybe aren't causing me a problem right this second? Like that pneumo is just a pneumo until it becomes a tension pneumo that we gave them. But saying we're not going to wait for these things to just evolve and see what happens. We're going to proactively try and identify them and address them before things get out of hand. I'm going to jump on that right there. Because, Ready to go. Yeah, because I, I, I want to know, like, where is the... Uh, the the giant I'm gonna put the tinfoil hat on the giant pandemic of people dying from post post Ross sequela right like for how many years has the standard of care been that we don't need a whole body CT after an out of hospital cardiac arrest and now there's literature that's been published in the last few years for like for me right the classic example people cite is a tension pneumo you broke some ribs mm -hmm. you've intubated the person you're pumping their chest full of air we got to identify that we got to be proactive well, there's literature to say now and even traumatic like tension or traumatic pneumothoraces like we probably don't even need to put chest tubes in all these people even if they have positive pressure ventilation there's only like maybe a 20 percent conversion to a tension pneumo and in the studies that looked at that observational group in trauma again it's not you know i would say that a, a ross patient's a tra trauma victim as well if you've done cardiac uh cpr properly like they are able to be observed for a considerable amount of time and not have to have the long the chest tube the whole prolonged state potentially so I guess, what are the things that you want to be proactive about? Well, I would also say we don't know how many patients this is happening to because the rate of rearrest is so high. We don't know why these patients are rearresting, right? I mean, some of them are just rearresting because whatever caused them to arrest in the first place, we haven't fixed or they're just not going to make it. But we don't actually know how many of them are rearresting due to arrest sequelae. You know, also, I think our job with super sick patients is to identify low probability, high risk things. That's our job. And so I think, you know, these patients, what's my downside? Extra radiation? I'm not, I have bigger problems right now. I'm not so much worried about that. They're high probability for something being bad. And between not just post-arrest sequelae, but post-arrest sequelae, as well as anything that might have caused them to arrest, between those two things, if I go on a fishing expedition, I have a high pretest probability I'm going to find something that may change my management in these patients. So I think I'm not going to disagree with Sarah because that would be scary. But <laughs> <laughs> but but no, I think I, I think the way that I'm hearing you talk about that is from a little bit more of the ICU perspective. Once I have this patient stabilized and I still don't maybe have a great answer for why they arrested like this isn't somebody going off to the cath lab because they obviously had a cardiac arrest from a big stemmy. Um, I, I think what I fear about pushing this like yes everybody has to have a whole body CT scan that arrested is that when we kind of grab onto like, okay, this is our new protocol. I'm scared that that person, our goal is just like, okay, now we got to get them to the scanner because where do people go to arrest again? Cause the, uh, the rate of arrest after arrest is very high. Um, it's the CT scanner, it's the MRI. So when we, I, I fear that the push will be, all right, we got to get them to the scanner. We got to find that dissection or maybe that PE or maybe nothing, or maybe that little brain bleed. Um, when, I think in those at least first few minutes, hours, we really need to focus on our resuscitation. We need to get an A-line. We need to make sure we know what their blood pressure is doing. Um, we've probably just pumped them all full of epi. What's going to happen in the next 10 minutes? Are they going to code again? Are they going to become very hypotensive? Um, what's their end title doing? I mean, things like are just good post ross care. I, I think is more of, I, I'm just worried that if we say yes, whole body CT for everyone on the way to the ICU, if we still don't have an answer, absolutely. Cause we need to know what's going on and look for some of those complications from CPR. But pushing that at the beginning makes me nervous that we're not going to, we're going to miss out on focusing on good post Ross care. Yeah. And I mean, I think like if you look at the CT first study, right, the the people who were excluded were essentially like there's some vagueness and who actually got anyone with coronary the artery disease. Yeah, <laughs> it was like oh, if you you have a reasonable idea as to why this person arrested, totally. excluded. Right. Okay. So then, if this post arrest post the second arrest phenomenon is like something we really need to get the diagnostic answer to, don't those people also potentially have something? Like, could we be wrong? Like that's a weird exclusion thing, right? The second thing, um, you know, a lot of the things that are identified in these studies, so the Vinial uh, study in 2020 was a radiology study that did a whole body CT. Again, it was observational. It's like f we can find a lot of radiographic things that are wrong with the patient if we CT scan them. If they have a clinical consequence, 
remains to be shown. And, and for me, the question when you're arguing for the application of a diagnostic test is it does it solve a clinical problem for the patient? Because otherwise, like, yeah, let's just CT every chest pain because why not? We can get an answer about something that's going on. Um, I don't know, Mel, when you were deep in your practice. Deep. Deep. This was not even an issue that was being debated. No, we, this was not something that we even would think about doing. So um, my thoughts on this are the same as yours. If you look, you will find. Uh, you'll find a whole bunch of shit. And you don't have to be a genius to know what you're going to find. The first time you do CPR on a 90-year-old, you're like, I just think I just broke everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so you'll find a lot of stuff. So these studies get published because they've got all these positive findings. But the real important question is, w did it change management? Yes. And what is the number needed to screen? How many of these CTs am I going to have to do before it actually changes management and changes outcome? These are disease-oriented outcomes, and they're very impressive. They found a pneumothorax, and they found a broken rib, and they found a mouse in the person's buttocks, and they did all this stuff. <laughs> doesn't matter if it doesn't change management. So the one study we have so far, and there's a lot of these, was a branches study in resuscitation, and they didn't show a difference in outcome. So I think that's got to be the question. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't CT some people. The person who comes and goes, oh, I, you know, the story is I got chest pain and then I got lightheaded and then when I got there, it was VTAC and then they died. And it's like, that person didn't need nothing. The person who's like, ah, and then they drop dead. I think there might be something in their head <laughs> first. So I still think you can use clinical criteria most of the time. And then there might be circumstances when Sarah's upstairs, she's like, I don't really know what's going on here and we should scan them. But I think as a routine... I don't think it's a good idea. And if our poll is correct, it's certainly not standard care because 90% of the people on the poll internally here that we had um, yeah. say, oh, I don't do that. Yeah. Although the branch study was never powered to show a difference in outcomes. That mm -hmm. wasn't how the study was designed in the first place. And I think there's sort of two separate questions. So what Brent was addressing was, when do we do this? And obviously, it would be a dumb idea to be like, stop everything. Stop resuscitating. Don't put in an A-line. Don't mm -hmm. stabilize the patient. Go to CT scan right now. So I think there is a danger in being too literal. And I know that, you know, organizations tend to do that when there's sure. a recommendation. We right. tend to go very literal and all in, and that would be a dumb thing to do. But I would argue that's a dumb thing to do in any context. And so do I think we should make it our rule? Every patient post ross gets CT'd? Absolutely not. That being said, though, I think like many things, we overestimate our ability to know what's going on with the patient, to believe we know the cause of arrest when actually we don't, to believe we have a full picture of what's happening. Also, I think in terms of going on a fishing expedition, because this is basically what Mel said. He's like, why is this pan fishing expedition? Like, why are we going on a fishing expedition? It depends on my pretest probability, right? Like, if I have a really high pretest probability, something's horribly wrong with the patient, I am much more willing to go on a fishing expedition. And this patient just declared themselves in the most unequivocal way possible. There's something really, really wrong with them. I mean, it's the same reason, like, say you have an 85-year-old coming in with abdominal pain, diffuse abdominal pain. How hard do you really think about whether you should CT their belly? Zero. Zero. What? <laughs> I, I, I don't think hard. Well, right? like, do well, not like, think hard. You don't think that hard about it. About it. <laughs> I don't know. You... Like the number of times though, I've been signed out an 85 year old with abdominal pain that was mm -hmm. constipated, and it was like totally. CT ordered from triage. Like that person waited six hours in our department sure. when if someone just talked to the patient and was like, "I can't poop." All right, well, hey, uh, can you come back tomorrow? If you, you know, like I, I do think there is some times to think about it. You know, I, totally. I, I disagree with that though in an 85 year old. I, I do because there's so many times that you think it's nothing and then something's perfed. I just do not trust old people with abdominal pain because clinically and off history, it can seem like the ben most benign thing and then you get the scan and there's something horrendous. So, so I, you're saying there's an argument for taking the person who's walking past the emergency department who's 88 years old and say, hey, <laughs> grab him. come here, <laughs> you, I'm just gonna okay. scan you. you. That's not what I'm saying. But my, my, the, I think to Sarah's question, how hard I think about scanning that person is I don't think very hard because their risk of having something that is going to increase their morbidity and mortality tremendously is too high not to scan them if they're coming in with complaints of abdominal pain. And, and I get that. I also think there's like a few other factors in my mind. Like one, I think like where does that leave the state of emergency medicine kind of? Because then like it's kind of a slippery slope to just scan everything and kind of not use clinical judgment. But I also think there's a false equivalency argument here. Like an 85-year-old with abdominal pain has something to lose. Someone who's 
died and we have no idea why they died they died and they had questionable bystander cpr like all this other stuff like yeah like the the reason why it's so hard to show an outcome change in any of these studies is because the outcomes are universally poor like and once you've already arrested there's not I mean, as much at stake for a lot of patients where we don't have an easily identifiable reversible cause of cardiac arrest within the ED, you know? Is it because we're just not looking, right? Like these patients where we don't have an easily identifiable but reversible cause? I, I, if that's the case, I think that I would like to see the study to show that, right? In this, the CT first study, so you're telling me if there's something that's significant enough to cause someone to go into cardiac arrest, it's a structural abnormality that can be seen on a CT within six hours, like... I don't know, like a ruptured dissection. If you waited six hours on that, what's that person's outcome honestly going to be? They're probably dead already. Yeah. (laughs) Right. And I think, I think also to Sarah's point that this branch study really was looking at like the diagnosis. Like if we were missing a lot of PEs and aortic dissections that we didn't already, that the clinician in the branch of the study that didn't get the whole body CT and just, you know, scanned as needed would have missed. Um, And so I think it's hard from this study to say anything about like did that change outcome because I don't think that was actually specifically what the paper was looking at but also I think there's I think we're at least for me it's like splitting hairs like if they're if we still don't exactly know the cause of arrest and they're still alive at six hours stable enough to go up to the ICU then maybe it's worth scanning them because we still don't have a good answer and they're still alive I mean six hours post rocks like that's pretty good So I think in that case, you could make an argument. I guess my concern is if we make a protocol like we've seen with sepsis and all these things of all these people getting lactates and three liters of fluid that definitely don't need it or it's going to actually harm them, this this protocol to be like, yes, everybody needs to get a whole body CT, I think it'll be more harmful than good because we will not be focusing on the things that we need to focus at that moment. Yeah, and I agree with that. And I think that the idea of when the CT is performed is kind of a whole different question, you mm-hmm. know? Like, I think the routine post rosc whole body CT in the emergency department has a lot of problems because uh, I think we haven't even talked about it. Where are those other resources going? You know, like I trained in an academic center where there's literally a resident appointed to do like the trauma rectal exam. You have more hands than you know what to do with, right? That's someone's entire job. Where now I can work in a rural site where if I send that critically ill patient to the CT scanner, I have maybe one nurse left. That's it. Because there has to be someone to bring the vent over, bring the pumps over. And it's like all the other patients are not going to get care. They're not going to make it to get the scans that they need the amount of time. So in my opinion, if it could wait six hours, then is it honestly an emergency to get it done? And can that be something the ICU coordinates? I don't know. Mo, you had your hand. Yeah. um, There's a great discussion coming up on MRAP on this. Uh, Scott Weingarten actually sent me another note, email saying... um, you guys are all fools. You don't know what you're talking about. I was like, that's how we always tell them. <laughs> I'm yeah. uh, But it is a good question. It's like, is this a diagnostic why you're arrested? Or is this a diagnostic what the hell did I do to you to try and get you back? They're two different questions. Uh, they might be important. But I think that there is a big discussion there um, that's coming up. Um, but I would hate to see this as a routine. But you know what's going to happen? This is going to become routine. But here's the thing I would like to see, like a post rosc routine. Like you should do a post rosc rush exam. Look at the heart. Like look at like the fact that we have so many actual intervenable and reversible causes. Of, you're not going to diagnose hyperkalemia on a CT scan, you know. And like I think if that becomes the priority is to get this imaging and to turn our brains off to not do thinking. Oh, there we go. Turn yeah. the brains off. This is the thing exactly. <laughs> and I think this is actually my problem with so much of this is that. We put this into the category like we keep trying to do with things with emergency medicine that stop thinking, follow a protocol, check off the boxes, and it doesn't matter what you do that with. It never works. It's always a bad idea. And I think it would be a terrible idea to make this one more thing that we have to blindly check off a box in a way that makes no sense. And so to me, it's really about when we have a patient post-arrest, our priorities are stabilize the patient, try and prevent them from arresting them again find out what caused the arrest and the sequelae of the arrest. And I think CT scan can be a very powerful tool for doing that, but it would be idiotic for us to be like, everybody must get a CT scan post arrest. I think that would actually be dangerous, Mm -hmm. but I do think that we don't do it often enough Mm -hmm. and I do it quite frequently. We should uh, definitely, um, there's gonna be many more of these papers and what we should be doing is make sure when you read these papers, when uh, they come, you understand, ask that question like, did it change management? Is it important? Yes, there's a lot of people who are dead for a long time that have cerebral edema and other bad things. Is it gonna change management? So um, just as humans, 
And as doctors, we love tests. And when a test positive, we're all excited. And there's a lot of positives in these. But again, that's not the question. The question is, did it change management? If we're going to do this as a routine, um, we need a big study, a huge study to really find that out. And that's going to take a while. But in the meantime, everybody, every radiology department, every assistant professor is going to make associate professor by doing this study because <laughs> it's easy to go back and look at all the dead people. <laughs> yeah, if you look at that, uh, the radiology study, uh, I forget the name the, of the paper. The Vignal et al. Yeah. paper, yeah. Um, I mean, again, and to Sarah's point, like it is uh, rare that we're going to find the dissection in these types of things. And it, it's very concerning if we miss those. But what you see when they pan scan these people post arrest, it's like they had pilo. They had an ileus. And it's like, okay, <laughs> well, that doesn't help me now. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I think like to your to your point, Mel, there's when reading these papers, you got to ask yourself, is, is this a thing that we're doing for us or for the patient? You know, like, do I, I want to have the answer? I want to know all these things. Or does it actually benefit the person that's getting the care? And it's hard to tell. Like, you know, the argument that I guess some people would make from the authors of the paper that, you know, why are we excluding all the people we know the reason why they arrested? If the sequela of getting CPR are so dangerous, then, well, why are we just saying, ah, those people can deal? You know, like, I think it's just we're trying to find a way to deal with our own uncertainty about these. I would love to see the paper where the protocolized approach to post ROS care versus just put them in a CT scanner. Maybe that could be the next huge study that someone can fund. And you know, there's arrests and there's arrests. If it's the 93 year old lady with metastatic breast cancer who comes in arrest and you didn't have her DNR orders, please do not scan that lady. If it's a 20 year old and uh, you know, sure. it's a totally different story. So that's why this do it for everybody is just silliness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but that's silliness but the lower for every threshold thing might, in medicine. Be, might be reasonable in some cases. Who are you scanning, sir? So yeah. if I have somebody who it is abundantly clear why they arrested and I need to do something about that immediately, then I'm not scanning them because I have better things to do with them. Um, if I have people that I am in any way unsure of why they arrested, or there's a little bit of diagnostic unclarity, because remember, often our echo and our EKG, I don't know what it's telling me right after arrest. Mm -hmm. You know, so we'll yeah. ultrasound them and we'll be like, the RV's big and the LV looks a little punky and it must have been a cardiogenic or, well, maybe, but I don't know what that means right after arrest. So I scan a lot of people um, because from a patient outcome kind of thing, the other thing I think about is the injured brain. And here's the thing, these patients are very tenuous. They often re-arrest, but even if they don't re-arrest, the injured brain all of a sudden can't auto-regulate. And what's really, really bad for the injured brain is hypoxemia and hypotension. Mm -hmm. So if I can do whatever it is that I can do to keep that patient stable, to be proactive, not reactive, identify things that haven't run wrong yet, but have the potential to go wrong, to me, that also helps me protect the brain. And I don't think there's ever going to be a study that's going to be like definitively do this. It changes outcomes in all patients. But I think that's asking the wrong question. We shouldn't be trying to be like in every single patient with this, we should always do this. Those statements, that's not being medicine. That's not being a doctor. That's just I don't know, trying to make our lives easy. So I scan most people unless they're one, too unstable for scanner. You gotta stabilize them first because we're arresting in the scanner, not helpful. Or two, there's something so unequivocal that I'm sending them for management of whatever that thing is. They're having a massive bleed, they need to go to cath lab. Otherwise, I scan most people when they're stable to do so. I would challenge you to say that uh, the Sarah Craig I know is gonna look after the person's brain whether yeah. they did the CT scan or not. If they died and they came back, you're looking after their brain, whether you did that CT scan or not. But I can do it better. So like, let's say that the patient does have a pneumothorax mm -hmm. and I now am intubating them sure. and they have, I'm going up on their peep because they're a little hypoxemic. Everything's going fine. Then they get really, really, really hypoxemic. I do a good ultrasound. I'm like, Daha, they have a pneumothorax. So now I'm going to put a chest tube in, but now they're hypotensive and hypoxemic. If I could have known that before that happened, I think I'm helping their brain because the injured brain and the immediate post-arrest patient, I don't have a lot of room to maneuver here. I, Hypotension, hypoxemia, bad for that injured brain. Knowing earlier to me is better. I totally agree with you. And I mean, I guess maybe we can oxygenate the exohexol contrast as well. <laughs> really get that up. That would right. be lovely. <laughs> can we do that study? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like I, I also think we have to dispel this myth that like the CT scan is an absolute study, right? It's interpreted by a human being and like, I'm sure we've all had the experience of caring for a trauma patient that like got a really early CT off the rip, very tiny pneumo, later got intubated for something, pneumo expands, right? So it's, I can understand that point of being able to troubleshoot problems in the future, but I, st 
I think the Numo example, like, I know you're a very careful and thoughtful intensivist. You're watching those pressures. When that mm -hmm. alarm goes off, like your thought's going to be, yeah, we just like mashed on this guy's chest for 35 minutes. Maybe that's what's going on, you know? Um, but I agree. Like if we can avoid those periods of hypotension, absolutely, that'd be wonderful. I just don't, I'm just not convinced that having the CT, like would you prophylactically put a chest tube in for a small, tiny new motor? No, device? absolutely not. Sure. But it helps me then when the patient starts falling apart. I mean, you always go through your differential diagnosis and so forth and so on. But to me, in these high risk patients where mm -hmm. the downside of doing the CT scan, if I'm you know, making sure the patient's stable before I go, what is the downside to the individual patient, right? Like contrast administration. I mean, we can have a whole nother conference <laughs> about contrast administration, but like that's not well, really a problem. Radiation, I, they have bigger problems. Like what's the downside for the individual? I, I think for the individual, nothing. But I think we should uh, think about like in the situation that we are currently in with wait times the way they are, with beds not existing in the hospital, taking up these resources isn't negligible. Um, and especially in, Scott, your situation when it takes out pretty, pretty much half your hospital staff to do that. Mm -hmm. um, that's when I think, okay, it, am I going to, am I so worried that I'm going to miss something that is actually going to change management of this patient? Or do I need to get this person up to the ICU and focus on the 100 other patients I have in the ER? Um, I, so I, I, of course, this, the scanning this person, giving them radiation, giving them contrast, no, it does not individually affect the person. But when you have to think about the department and limited resources, it might. Yeah, and I mean, I, I really don't buy into the financial argument because if you're a post ross patient, you're, exactly. in the United States, you already <laughs> you paid $10 problems. million dollars <laughs> yeah, to be alive. That so, ship has sailed. Yeah, you're going to die of bankruptcy now. But um, <laughs> I, I do think, though, that there is like, a potential risk of sending this person with like you're not potentially going to be there when they're in the scanner there's you know a line gets pulled you're moving them over someone knocks the vent whatever um and i guess i i think we have to in the emergency department not just limit the risk and benefits to the individual patient sometimes with resource intensive or potentially resource intensive uh interventions why like ecmo isn't feasible for every single person that type of thing but i do think you're right i mean i but I just don't think we know enough. And I think my big concern is like when you hear people talk about whole body CT post Rosk, it's like, yeah, it's a no brainer to do. And, and obviously like I still CT people. I do a whole body CT on some patients, but I'm very selective about it. And the thing that keeps me up at night is like, well, shit, like how certain was I that that actually was that massive subarach, you know, like in, in making those clinical decisions. And I just think if I scanned every single person, it's not going to make me better at making clinical decisions, nor do I think it's going to help that many people, you know? So it's, and I think maybe that's a tension for my friends who work in the community also feel it's like they want to alleviate their concern about missing something or giving the patient the best possible outcome. And there's no good substitute for like knowing the answer all the time, you know? I, oh, sorry, go ahead. There's a good uh, ethics question in here, which oh. is um, from Quentin Gurman. It says, food for thought ethically, based on this data, would you want a whole body CT scan done on yourself if you were in ROSC, uh, post ROSC in the hospital? would um, or would you let the staff uh, not do it? So I'm gonna say this, the way I'd answer that is, if this is my 85 year old grandmother with dementia, no. And if it's my 24 year old son, yes. So even that is just sort of uh, being a doctor to at least to some degree is like, that's why I, I hate the idea of protocolizing. Every post arrest patient, they're not the same. Um, just, even just do it by age or some other criteria, but do, not do it by I died and you got me back <laughs> magically because you pushed too much epi. Or let's just not protocolize <laughs> it at all, yeah. in fact, because all these decisions, you know, there's the individual patient level, but then you do have to make the decision of your own triage within, am I the only one here? How busy is the CT scan? Is one of them broken? Mm -hmm. And so I think that unless you have something, and there are very few things this is true about, where there's such clear unequivocal evidence yeah. about a benefit that we can say everybody must do this all the time. That's a va I mean, I'm trying to think of something like that and I can't. This is not one of those things. So I think that we absolutely should not protocolize this, but I do think that we shouldn't over our estimate our ability to be yeah. like, I am completely sure that this guy arrested because of fill in the blank. And we also have this bias where if we find something wrong with them, we think that's why they arrested. Patients are allowed to have many, many things mm -hmm. wrong with mm -hmm. them. And just because we find that one doesn't mean it's the only one. That's fair. Yeah. Well, that was a great discussion. Yeah. I'm still right.
Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I actually think so we all from this. kind of came to the yeah. same yeah. participation yeah, prize for everybody. It yeah. shouldn't. There shouldn't be a protocol on this. That's yeah. dangerous. You should be thoughtful. And this is already a really, really yeah. sick patient cohort. The fact of the matter is, you're probably going to find something on your CT now. Whether or not that changes management, I think that's still up for debate. But yeah, I think that's a great summary. If you're an ultrasound person out there, I'd love to. I'm not the world's biggest, as we'll I'll just see in like one second here, I guess, when we do a procedure of the month, um, deep in the ultrasound world. But I would love to see some papers on post-ROSC ultrasound, similar like the whole body ultrasound scan, something at the bedside would be kind of cool. We're going to do our procedure of the month next. So stick around. All right, everybody, welcome back to this nice, tight, very uncomfortable close-up <laughs> shot. Uh, we're here for the procedure of the month. We've got Tom operating our Steadicam, which currently right now might be a little bit of an unsteady cam. Just jumped up from his seat. Great work, Tom. Uh, we're going to be talking... Tom's drinking, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> we're going to be talking about uh, supraclavicular subclavian lines. Actually, a paper written by our very own in the studio, Mel Herbert, in 2009. Round yeah. of applause. One of the greatest papers ever written, I believe. <laughs> I, a, I, lot I, 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 a lot of people are saying. A lot of people are saying. I've heard that. I've heard that. Um, so we're going to go over it a little bit. You might be used to the regular... Uh, you know, infraclavicular approach to the subclavian line. We've got this great set of models here. Um, very lovely group at a, a company called Limbs and Things has hooked us up with these for this evening. So a huge shout out to them. Um, and you can see in this, I wish I learned how to do central lines on this type of model. Uh, that We've got in the clear acrylic here, you know, you've got your IJ, you've got your subclavian, and then you've got this confluence of the two right here, this beautiful, big, juicy venous point where you just want to get into, right? And we're used to doing this approach from down here to get the subclavian, but, you know, maybe 30 years ago, someone had the brilliant idea of like, what if we just aimed for that target there and hit the subclavian as it reached the IJ? Um, this is a procedure that was initially described without the use of ultrasound, uh, and I think it's a, a really amazing landmark baseline. Uh, the idea behind this approach was that you can see there's, you know, your arterial badness is pretty well shielded away from you if you're using this approach correctly. You know, you've got the subclavian artery hanging out down here, the lungs way down here, and while you might have a mispoke in those directions, either hitting the pleura or hitting the artery when you're doing with a traditional subclavian approach, going super clavicularly, you kind of got really nothing to hit if you're going at the right angle. Uh, and so the paper that Mel wrote reviewed some of these different outcomes. It was like a bunch of papers published on this approach that he reviewed. Um, showed a pretty low complication rate, actually on par with some ultrasound-based lines done at the time. You know, this was 2009, though, so you had your original iPod having a good time at home. Um, so things have changed a little bit since then. So we've got a mannequin here that we're actually going to demonstrate this access point on just to get some of the basics of the procedure down. Obviously, you know, this is not a, uh, a sterile mannequin. I'm not going to wear gloves to perform this procedure, but just to give you guys an idea of where you should go if you've never done this line before. Uh, we're going to do two views. You got the side view here because there's two angles that you really need to know. We got to know how much up and down you need, like what's our angle of attack of the needle to hit the line. And then we also have to know here in this horizontal plane what angle we need to approach this way. What's wonderful about this line is you've got some great landmarks on people with some decent anatomy. You've got the, the clavicular head of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the clavicle itself forming this nice little pocket here. That's why sometimes this line is referred to as the pocket shot, because you're going to shoot the needle into the pocket. And you read some papers they describe going one centimeter from the clavicle, one centimeter from the head of the SCM to get into that pocket. But what I like to do on the top down shot, you can see is I just put my thumb in the pocket because I'm a simple man and I have a thumb that's about one centimeter in each direction. So I know if I start my approach from my nail bed or where my nail bed would be under gloves, I can reliably aim where I need to go. And the other great part about using your thumb here is it also hooks you up with the angle that you want to be at in the horizontal plane, shooting for the contralateral nipple or where you imagine the apex of the heart is of the patient. That's the trajectory that we're trying to take. 
So when we've got our depth down and we've ended up in this middle of this triangle, splitting that 90 degree angle, now we need to figure out how high and low we need to be. Some authors will tell you 10 degrees, some will say 15 degrees. It's a lot shallower than you'd imagine on a regular person and what you might be used to doing for an ultrasound guided line where you're really coming in at a high angle of attack here. So we'll see, we hopefully we've pressurized this mannequin correctly, demonstrate just where the line might be, going down in there. Let's see if we can hit it. And you can see that I've only inserted the needle like one centimeter, maybe two centimeters. And that's the real advantage of this line, in my opinion, is that it's almost always, even very obese people, a pretty shallow approach. And you can get a, a beautiful poke looking just like that. I'm gonna go ahead and return our Gatorade Arctic Blue Blood to the patient. They need all they can get. Some other tips for the line, um, if you can't identify these landmarks, actually lifting the patient's head up a little bit can really help bring out those two muscles, palpating a lot, turning the patient's head to the contralateral side. The right-sided approach is recommended because you got that straight shot right into the confluence of the IJ and the subclavian, that big juicy pouch you can even see right down here, right? That's where you're shooting for. I don't know, do you guys have any experience doing this line? Mel, I mean, did you do it before you wrote the paper? <laughs> I uh, wrote this paper because I was terrible at subclavians and um, I was just reading about subclavian lines and then it was in, I think it was in uh, Robertson Hedges that he talked about this approach and I'm like, the what? I said, what? And so then I did a deep dive and then when I was at UCLA, I started doing it on everybody and I tried to convert all of the UCLA ridden. like, this is the greatest thing in the world. Then when I went to USC, the same thing again. And I was just stunned at, um, first of all, how much literature was, how old the literature was, and how much effing easier it is to do this than it is a subclavian. I never really worked out how to do a subclavian properly. I would miss it all the time. So this is terrifyingly easy to do because it's just there, just like you saw. It's right there. If you're burying that needle, like, no, you're doing a cut out box. Yeah. Bring that puppy back. Um, but it's just, I just found it so much easier, and that's why we did that literature review. And since that review... There's been a number of other studies with ultrasound, without ultrasound, from the anesthesia literature uh, in other groups that basically say the same thing. Your first pass success is significantly higher with this line than it is with subclavian and the, con the complications are significantly less. So I actually don't know why anybody at this stage doesn't use that as their first approach. It's, some people have said this is basically just a modified IJ, which it kind of is, but it kind of isn't. Yeah. It's its own thing. It's just a different spot, and it is easy, baby. It sounds so <laughs> cool to say pocket shot. That's why you got to do the sure. line. That's and guess like you know, guess who knows how to do this better than you? Drug users, <laughs> IV drug users. We have we were putting this line, and this guy's like, "Yeah, I shoot up there all the time." I'm like, dude, leave us one thing. <laughs> leave us one. This was the one spot. This is the man. one spot that's left. It's like, oh, yeah, you can just pop right in there. We all know that. Like, I see oh where you got the gosh. idea from the paper. You had a patient that was like, hey, dude, let me tell you let about this. Let me show this. you how to get this started, dude. You're terrible at this. <laughs> we, we, did a, we did a poll in the chat um, because, you know, I demonstrated a landmark-based approach. And about 55% of people said they were uncomfortable, I believe, with a landmark-based approach, if I'm hearing that correctly, um, which I think is totally understandable in this day and age. I mean, I think... I don't know how training was at UCLA. At USC, um, definitely landmark-based lines are something that is not only encouraged as a graduation like requirement, but like it's part of the culture to do like blind fems, blind subclavians. I kind of hate saying the term blind. I think it's kind of like because it's not actually blind. Yes, it is. You can't see it like it's on ultrasound, but landmark-based lines. Um, so. I think I've probably done an equal amount of landmark based lines compared to ultrasound guided ones, at least in training. Mm -hmm. And I prefer this line also for the ease of you're at the head of the bed, critically ill patient, you intubate them, whatever you're right there. Everything's beautiful. You drip their head to the side and you're good to go. But I'm curious to hear if you guys tried this line before. Or yeah, I have it as a tool in the toolbox. I mean, I, my feeling about landmark base versus non-landmark base is that when it comes to central lines, you need to have a lot of tools in your toolbox because mm -hmm. there's always going to be a situation and a patient when you're like, well, I can't do this and I can't do that and that doesn't work. Uh, oh, good, I can do this one. So I think it's good to have landmark base lines. I think like literature wise, blind subclavians we're just not that good at them. There's a lot of complications and we're really just not. And so if I do a blind line, this one or a blind femme. Now, that being said, when I say blind line, I will often, even if I'm planning on doing it blind, unless the reason I'm doing a blind line is because I just don't have an ultrasound, I will often take a quick look first and just make sure basically the anatomy is essentially where I think it is. They have something on that side. Because how many times have I gone in, especially in sick patients, like 
a sick dialysis patient yeah. maybe mm-hmm. who's had a bazillion lines on that side and I'm like, oh, I'll just do a blind thing up here. And then I ultrasound and I'm like, oh, they don't actually really have that vessel, surprise. Or their femoral anatomy is not at all like it's supposed you to be that the, whole uh, the like- twister ride where it's like the artery and vein are just doing one of these. And it's, cool. all and it's all scarred down. And so that's the thing. So I'll just, it's like the don't get all dressed up with nowhere to go thing, like before you start poking anywhere, I just ultrasound. But that being said, I think it's really useful to be able to have it in your skill repertoire that you can do landmark based lines, know where you're going to do them, practice one or two of them. And I think this is a really good one if you don't have an ultrasound. I'm going to be totally honest. Uh, I really don't ever do landmark landmark based lines. Um, and I guess my question for you, Sarah, would be like, if if you have the ultrasound and you're going to look with the ultrasound, then why put the ultrasound down? Totally. So in this particular <laughs> case, this is an why, excellent why question. You, if I can do it in the first place, this is an excellent question. And in this case, it's steric hindrance. Uh, sorry, that was a nerdy reference. Okay. Basically, if you have you tried to do this line with an ultrasound? I have. It's really, I find it really hard. There's just not a lot of real estate right there. And so sometimes the spot I want to go just doesn't have a lot of real estate. Um, And so that's part of the problem sometimes. Like in this particular case, I would never do a supraclavicular with ultrasound because I can't get all the things in there. Okay. Sometimes femorals, for example, a blind femoral, I actually personally, if I'm trying to put in a blind line during CPR, I actually find it easier to do a blind femoral because then my ultrasound's not bouncing and I'm trying to do it. I can just secure the spot and go. And so that's why, you know, I'll sometimes in these situations take a look, just make sure things are more or less where they're supposed to be Mm -hmm. and then have the skill of doing it blind. I couldn't agree more. And Britt, to your point, like, you know, when you look at the literature, like in subclavian specifically, like static versus ultrasound, static ultrasound versus like landmark based. Yeah, like we're pretty terrible at doing landmark based subclavians. But with a huge caveat that these are studies that are performed in the age of ultrasound education. Like I'm sure if we went to like the 1970s or docs that have been practicing for a significant amount of time that grew up on these lines, have done a thousand of these lines, like, and we put all of those people in that group, they would whoop us. Totally. Yeah. So I think, and I, I, I probably goes back to, I say this pretty frequently, like do what you know how to do best and do it quickly if that needs to be done for the resuscitation. And so for me, and I, I wish I could be like, yes, I'm this badass that does all these blind lines and I'm, I'm just not great at that. And I'm sure people that trained without ultrasound would exactly whoop my butt on that. Um, but I, I trained with ultrasound. So for me, it's just like, well, if I can see the artery in the vein and I can make sure I'm not stabbing the lung. Why would I do it any other way? And I understand that there are certain situations where it's anatomy and the ultrasound might be difficult in the code situation. But I mean, 99.9% of the time I am using the ultrasound. Yeah. And I think that's a great point that you make too. Like, I think there's a, I'll say at USC where I train, there is a bravado about doing landmark based on like, oh, I got the film, you know, like whatever. Yeah. It's like really like you got but the I, line. That's and all, you also all, caused the pneumothorax. So yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> all you care about is like, did you actually get the line for the patient at the time that they needed it? And I, I actually agree with you entirely, Sarah. Like the times that I do landmark based lines are where there's like, I'm crammed in the corner of the room and like whatever, like it's a pain in the butt to get the ultrasound over and to, or it's during a code where like, I know I can just do it and I feel very facile doing that. And it maybe doesn't matter as much to get like the first poke this one time and like a conscious patient who's like, you know, you're putting in, you just need an extra sight for their whatever fluids or something like that. And they're giving you a thumbs up in the corner. Um, so I couldn't agree more on that. Yeah, I, um, I'm, the only thing worse than subclavians uh, is ultrasound for me. I'm terrible. <laughs> I was terrible. Um, but I do the same thing when it comes to the sub supracavicular approach to the subclavian. I just put the ultrasound on there and like, is it in the right place? Because sometimes you're like, there's nothing there. This person's anatomy is upside down. Um, so, and then I just do it normally. But you can uh, combine both landmark and ultrasound. This is what I say to uh, a lot of people is, do your landmark, work out where you think it should be and where you should point, and then put the ultrasound on and do it with an ultrasound. But that way you're sort of training to do both. Because ethically, if somebody asked the ethic question, when you put my central line in, use the goddamn <laughs> ultrasound. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm at, well, I, 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 with That's the caveat, so like, do, do what you know how to do best, right? If you were not trained with ultrasound, it's not the first time to pick up the ultrasound, Yeah, and if you're right? 86 years old like me, you should be putting in central. <laughs> no, <I was> like, <laughs> just hard stop, just stop. <laughs> I was but, like, who's that guy that was shooting up? Get him that. Get, get that, that guy. Line, yeah. That yeah. guy. I, I, I think it's just the point. Do what you know how to do 
And for me, that is ultrasound. And I don't know if that makes me weak or not cool or whatever, but I, I just know that I'm going to have the lowest risk of complications and the highest risk of success by getting that line in with an ultrasound. Yeah. I don't think there should ever be like a value judgment on like what, like even I feel bad that you're using those terms like weak or whatever, like it shouldn't be that. in the same way that I think it's a harmful on the other side of the spectrum where you have someone who's like maybe really comfortable doing like a supraclavicular line and they're like, wow, you're like real reckless. You know, it's like, I don't, this is how no, I was trained it, it, and like, you exactly. know, this is, it's uh, how you're trained and what you know how to do. When here's a, in 2023, when are you guys placing central lines down? We got peripheral pressors on board. There's like more and more things we were realizing it's complete nonsense that we can't give through a peripheral line. That's good. This is where you guys freak me out. And I was like, you what? You don't put central lines in anymore? No. <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, I think it, this is all going to be patient specific, right? And yeah. for me, I, I think about like a bad hemorrhagic trauma or a bad GI bleed and I need to get blood into them now and quickly. And if there's going to be like 15 nurses with ultrasound guided IV to put in just a peripheral, it's like, that's all. If you have all the IOs and all the lovely 16 gauge peripherals working in the world, fantastic. But if that's taking longer and this person's clamping down, like put in the cordis because that's not I would do it with ultrasound. <laughs> That's not difficult to do. You have a big shot right there. And it, if people are messing around with the femorals in a critically ill or in with peripherals in a critically ill patient and they're bringing out the ultrasound to do peripheral IVs, put in the central line, put in the cordis, get the bigger line in. I, I, otherwise, I think for the most part, if it's just a conversation about pressors or yeah. calcium or whatever this can be even peripheral and i'm not trying to say i'm the world's biggest pocket shot advocate though i probably am uh i've i've definitely put a 16 like peripheral cath right in, into that spot and the same thing like doing a, like a peripheral ij people will say the best which honestly probably a sizable percentage of those were actually an ej i mean yeah. Yeah. fantastic love ages love that line and it's so underused and people freak out that something's going in the neck but when they're that sick it, you have time i feel like when we don't need to put in a central line because this drives me crazy. You have a super sick little, maybe elderly guy. He has pneumonia. He's septic, and he needs some pressors. We just gave him three and a half liters of fluid because that was thirty cc's per kilo, not twenty nine, but thirty. <laughs> and now what we're gonna do is be like, ah, we gotta start him on pressors. So we gotta put in a central line. So we're gonna take this guy who's eighty years old. He can barely breathe anyway. So we're gonna flip him upside down, smother him with a plastic sheet, and then poke around <laughs> with a needle next to his carotid artery. That's a dumb idea. Don't do that. And I feel like often we prioritize putting in a central line for somebody who doesn't need it right now. Put it in later. Put it in sterile. It's fine. So for pressors, I just don't usually do them right away. I mean, like we have abundant evidence right now their arm will not fall off. A hundred percent. I promise their arm will not fall off. Okay. But from the busy community docs perspective, working in the ER, asking an intensivist for some honesty, how many times when I send a patient up to them, I'm like, oh yeah, this guy's going to be off pressors in a day. I don't need to do the central line because I've got 50 other people to see. Do you end up having to just do it? Right. And, and I think there's a pushback sometimes that it's just a, a, a measure of punting, which I fully totally embrace. Like, listen, I always say, like, hey, do you want to come down and see the other 35 people in the waiting room? Because we could swap if you want to do that. That's cool. Um, but realistically, how often are you able to get them? Do you end up putting in a central line, I should say, after someone has been on peripheral prep, whatever, for whatever reason? Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. But if I do, it's not bought. Like, that's fine for me. Because one, I know it's a good clean line. Because if you're running around whoa, with 35 patients whoa. in the waiting room, I'm just All right. Dude, wow, shots fired. Wearing my shots AD fired. Hat? Like, I don't have time to do that. I'm just like, I wash oh, my hands at least fast. once a shift. Okay? Maybe <laughs> once and a half times if you get really lucky but no, no, no like I am totally fine with that because you know your job is to resuscitate them and get them to me alive and then that's totally fine with me and I know you may get some pushback from some people but I don't think you should especially in the little old person who I'm like we're gonna start some pressers and they're full code but like eh, what are we really doing here saving that person a central line even if I need to put one in a day from now great but I think that that comment about the clean the dirty line how many times when we send someone up with a central line, do they get to keep that central line? Usually, uh, they, they usually do. The truth comes out. But oh, like, really? no, but they, but they usually do. But just like, <laughs> you know, if it was like during a code, probably not and so forth and so on. But I, I think they usually do, which is, but that's part of it, right? Like if you send them up with a line, my threshold to pull it out and put in a new clean one, I'm probably not going to do that. But if you're just like, we have decent enough IV access. I did not have time to put in a line. This is going to be a complicated patient. Can you just do it upstairs? 
A hundred percent. Fantastic. I got a question. What's the definition of peripheral line when it comes to presses? Like, ah. okay, there's a little tiny one in the back of the head. <laughs> in the toe. <laughs> what is, this is an how, excellent question. How big a line? How peripheral how is peripheral? Long, yes, yeah. um, I think generally, in a, like when they're looking at these meta-analyses and studies, you're talking about an 18 in the AC. That is what you want. Would I put pressers through a 22 in the pinky? Not so much. Um, but an 18 in the AC... Yes, absolutely. But again, this is one of those like, if the patient weighs 500 pounds and somebody was like, well, I did an ultrasound and it's half out and it's kind of whatever. Okay, now I'm just going to put in a central line. Mm. But usually what I personally do is I just hard flush it right before I put them in. I feel pretty good about this line. It's a good spot. It's a big line. I'm good. And I don't know if you've ever seen somebody who's had extravasation of a vasoconstrictive agent. I'm sure you definitely have. It sucks. They're in a lot of pain and it's pretty miserable. And so for me and the conscious patient who like I, I'm maybe a little bit more cavalier about which lines I'll put pressers through if it's in any port in the storm situation and they really need it. Like while I'm troubleshooting another line, even if it's like a 22 in the hand, but it's a great line. We know it works really well. We try the flush. Everything's cool as a temporary measure. But I would agree in like these meta analysis, other studies and a lot of hospital protocols are like minimum 20 gauge things like that and the location has to be defined but i think we should also talk about times that we're not taught to put in a central line but maybe we wait too long and i think things like sick dka for example because what is the right limiting step for sick dka well it's their potassium and it's that we can't get the insulin and the potassium and the magnesium and all these things into them then 20 hours later you're like well we've had the insulin drip off for you know 18 of those 20 hours because we couldn't get all this stuff and we couldn't give POK because they were vomiting so i think when your care is being limited by you just don't have enough spaces to put places. Don't be like, central lines are for pressers and for nothing else. And so, you know, whether it's the trauma patient or the sort of sick patient that requires a lot of drips and electrolytes, don't hesitate to put one in. Um, but also don't waste your time putting one in the patient who just because they need pressers and they have a grade 18, don't spend the time putting them in that person. Go to the DK patient who has like one little dinky 20 and you're like, you need all this stuff. Spend your time putting one in that patient. I think that's a great point. We also are really not taught to think regularly about the indication for the central line and the placement of it, right? The person that has a K of like 0.9 that you're trying to replete, there's nothing like throwing a nice wire right into the myocardium back and forth <laughs> to yeah. really get that, you know, torsades cooking. Um, you know, and I think that's that's something that like taking a step back of if they need the line, like that also determines my location. Now that we have evidence that shows basically, turns out people drool and poop in pretty equal quantities in the ICU. So what's mm -hmm. the cleanest line might not matter so much by location. Well, I mean, the cleanest line is a subclavian. Sure. It's just, it's also the line with the most complications. But I do think, I mean, there was a 2015 New England Journal paper that was basically like, yeah, femorals don't have more complications than IJs in terms of infections. So great. I think as long as it's a clean line, but then every patient has different different considerations for where you want to put the line. You know, if I have a sick patient that I'm like cardiogenic shock, they're having dysrhythmias and they're shocky, I might need to put in a swan later. Having access to the right IJ is great. If I have a dialysis patient that has fistulas or they're going to need fistulas, I'll often go in the femoral because in a patient who has dialysis or probably is going to yeah. need dialysis, every time you cannulate the vessels in the neck and upper chest, yeah. you're making it harder for the next person. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying you need to have a big repertoire, a big toolbox of lines you're comfortable with, so that depending on the situation, the patient, the pathology, you can pick something appropriate from your toolbox. And that's what I think we should be teaching their residents, big toolbox. What about presses through an IO? You can do it. Yeah. <laughs> for how long? Uh, I don't know, because I've never pushed the envelope on that. Because if I'm just using it with an IO, I put something in. Yeah. I mean. I'm just thinking like that rural setting. I've yeah. got the IO and I'm starting the presser and it's like, can I do it for six hours? Can I do it for 10 hours? Is their bone marrow going to turn as mush? Is it going to come out of their buttocks? What's going to happen? I'm, I'm not aware of any evidence of like long term, because I just don't know like who would set those folks up for it. Yeah, but I, I, I kind of agree that I think if you truly have reached for the IO, like that is not a destination for access. You know, that's like a quick, like that's the thing a temporizing that see, measure. Yeah. The thing you see most, I think is like you get the IO and you know, we've had a critical resuscitation, intubated the person, blah, blah. Now you've got like three sedation drips, a presser, and you've got a TIB access point. And like in that point, I think 
it's a real waste of time when people are like, let's do an ultrasound IV peripherally. Like, just throw a line in. Yeah. You know? Um, okay, when the massive transfusion's going through the IO, like, you, yeah. <laughs> you probably need more access and big access. And I, I think the placement also is so important. I mean, how many times in a trauma patient who you're like, probably has a smashed pelvis and people are trying to put lines in <laughs> the femoral and you're like, that's going to be dumped nowhere. Yeah. Well, Mel, I want to end this part of the segment on something I thought was a really important point you made before about learning how to do some of these things. Because I think the hardest part about trying new procedures when you're out of residency is like you can wait for like a cadaver lab course once every five years where it's not at all realistic to what you're going to be doing. Or you can use existing techniques to help you learn new ones. So your point about using, if you want to get better at doing the supraclavicular subclavian approach with the landmarks, using the ultrasound, finding the space knowing that it's a safe place to go and then using a finder needle or something to try really sets you up for a much higher chance of success, more comfort for you as experimenting with this procedure and learning it. Um, and obviously still using trainer models and stuff like that. But I found that to be a very helpful technique. Yeah. And if uh, speaking to all the old docs out there, it's, it's um, really common when you put on courses and stuff to have people say um, sheepishly, I graduated six years ago and I haven't put a central line in, but I know I need to know how to do that as an ER. Um, same with chest tubes, same with a lot of things. It's it's okay for you to be out for a while and go, I haven't done this. Yeah. Um, and you do need to have that skill. So I do suggest to people like, go do a procedure course, go do a cadaver course, every however amount of time you feel comfortable. It's almost ubiquitous for people that leave big centers and go to little centers that those skills diminish. And you still have to have them because when the the truck with all the babies crashes outside your hospital, you're going to have to do this. A hundred percent. And that, you know, the paper that came out a few years ago um, in the uh, annals of emergency medicine, right? That showed the average number of times attendings intubate in the community it's like 10 a year like that was like a, maybe a month in residency you know and i think no matter how well you trained if you're you're just experiencing a normal patient pathology like you got to keep up on those skills and realize that everyone's going through that so i, I do love when people go to those courses and they're like yeah i just graduated a few years ago but i need to spend some time learning this again it's, it's a really great point you know let's jump into now taking a pivot from doing central lines in weird places to some ethics cases you guys are down for it. Let's do it. We've had some ethical questions from the chat already, which is super exciting. Um, so we've got two cases to talk about tonight. The first one, I'd like to imagine yourself in the mindset of a single practitioner community setting, you know, single coverage. Um, let's say you have like a 25-year-old guy who's brought in just right off of the street, has a single stab wound to the chest, is talking to you, has vital signs, is in your emergency department. And as you're arranging immediate 911 transfer for this patient, they lose vital signs in front of you. Do you do a thoracotomy on this patient? How do you approach their resuscitation? So there's not a friendly surgeon who happens to be no, driving by your hospital at this no, very you, moment. Nope, no one. You've got a general surgeon you can, who's on call, who knows where they are right now. This just was dropped in off the street. I think my next question would be, do you see tamponade on the ultrasound? Uh, I guess you could try to look for tamponade on okay. the ultrasound. Yeah, in this case, it's unclear. Let's just say you don't know or you don't have ultrasound. Okay. If you did see tamponade, would you be willing to cut? I'd, I'd be more willing to. I mean, if I'm assuming I've already done, bi like I'm doing bilateral chest tubes. So let's okay. just assume I've done that. So you're starting with that. I'm starting with that because okay. single easy, stab wound here. Single stab wound, I'm just going to stick in. Like if I'm at the point that I'm like, sorry, I don't, I'm just going to stick in bilateral chest tubes, done. Okay. But to me, this is like, what's my end game? What's my exit strategy? Because if I open the chest and it's something that like, okay, now I have a dead patient with an open chest as opposed to a dead patient without an open chest, like what have I done here? And so to me, the big thing that I may have an exit strategy is if they're coding because they have a tamponade, I can you know open the chest, deliver the heart, and stick a staple in and cross fingers until the surgeon gets here. And so that's why it kind of matters to me. Whereas, you know, if their aorta is destroyed, if their pulmonary artery is destroyed, like I can't do anything about that that I know how to do. So if I have an intervenable thing that still low probability, but hypothetically, I know how to do the definitive or not the definitive thing, but the temporizing thing that I can maybe get them to the point that somebody could do something definitive, I would consider it. Brit, How far to... away is the surgeon? <laughs> this is, a great is there like a sur no? Because this matters, right? If there is a surgeon that like maybe will come in an hour, then even if I see tamponade, I mean I have an open chest. What what are we what are we doing? Um, but if there is a surgeon 
within the vicinity somewhere that is on call that could come in. I mean, this is a, you said 25 year old guy. Yeah. I mean, and it's so easy to be like, yeah, I do the thoracotomy and I'm sitting right here in this nice blue chair. Um, but seeing that patient in front of you, having the resources that sound very limited, this is a really, really hard decision. So I think there is no right or wrong answer. Um, I think if there was a surgeon on call that could come to the hospital within the near future, I would give it a shot. Okay. Mel. Um, well, I can tell you that I've th been in this situation uh, twice uh, that I remember really clearly. So one was at all of you and it was gunshot wound to the chest and all of you was not a trauma center and um, not many resources. And we got all excited and we did a thoracotomy and it was like six o'clock at night. And just as the sort of head of surgery is leaving, we were calling surgery. Oh my God, oh my God. And he comes by and it turns out the patient died. But he pulled me aside and said, don't you ever do a thoracotomy in this hospital ever again unless it's between like nine and three, Monday <laughs> to Friday. Because there's just no way they're going to get to the OR in time to be safe. Yeah, you guys sent out the memo to the community. <laughs> Banker's hours, guys. But he was very practical. It's just like we're all off site. It's just not going to happen. Getting the nurses, getting the hours. It's like what you've done is just prolong the inevitable. Uh, so that was one I remembered very well, um, and we can talk about the ethics of that. But then another one was at a the community rotation I did at UCLA, and same situation, it wasn't my patient, but it was one of the docs that was there, and he did the thoracotomy, and he actually stitched the heart, and then for the next 12 hours tried to find somewhere to, with this guy mm. where they couldn't look after him at that hospital, and we watched him slowly die over the rest of the shift because there was nowhere to send him to. Um, so it's all about knowing your resources, what's really possible, because you can do so much stuff, but if you can't fix the thing and you're just going to delay the inevitable, that depends on where you work. So if you're in Africa in the middle of nowhere and I can do a thorough economy, but there is nothing that else can be done, that's a terrible way to die. Um, so I think it's really the ethics is about knowing your situation, knowing what comes next. Not just because you can doesn't mean you should. 100%. Yeah, that's interesting. I So I think in the, the chat poll that we just put out asking those people the question, about 57% of people, I think, said no, that they would not perform one in this circumstance. I think it's really challenging because I think it begs the... Obviously, we've like set this case up to be, this is the person's best chance of survival, right? They're a young, otherwise healthy person yeah. with a single penetrating wound to the yeah. chest. So if you like look at the data that is available for ED thoracotomies, it's like 15%, you know, whatever that means and applied to the end of one patient in front of you. Um, I think it's really wise to think about like, what are the downstream resources for this person? I can say having like in single community, like jobs that I've worked, like no one's ever coming in for this. Uh, if you, they would have to be alive for like 12 hours for the general surgeons there, unless you like catch them, like trying to get a Snickers out of a vending machine or something. Um, and so it would be transferring that patient, which would oftentimes require you to go with the patient in the ambulance yeah. or whatever and shut down the emergency department that you're working in. I, I think it's, I mean, it's just such a hard question because I've, I have had one thoracotomy patient survive, and it was that person in their 20s, one stab to the heart. I was also at a level one trauma center with every trauma surgeon and cardiothoracic surgeon and everyone known to man right there in the OR within five minutes. Sure. So, I mean, in the best of circumstances, this is a, such a low survival rate. It's just, it's hard when you say 25 and one stab wound to the chest. Totally. That's hard. And I think, you know, I would definitely do the same approach as you, Sarah, the like bilateral finger thoracostomies mm -hmm. to see like, hey, can we drain this? I think it's an interesting point of on the ultrasound. So I guess the follow up question is on the ultrasound, you don't see tamponade. Do you just call it right then? Like what's the value in doing cardiac, uh, doing like CPR in somebody that has like a single penetrating injury to the chest that we know is not going to be operatively managed? Oh, like nothing, nothing. Oh, no, I, I, I would at that point, you just have to make a call. If he codes, you either open the chest or you call it because there's no point in doing, I mean, see, unless you think he also simultaneously arrested from something totally dead. I mean, I, I wouldn't. But still has a stab wound in right, the heart. Right, like the incidental <laughs> stab wound in the heart. Um, well, that's I guess. why you get the whole body oh, CT. Like, that's why you. Obviously, oh, good news <laughs> for whole body CTs. Um, but I, I, I think the butt is really exit strategy. Before you take an action, you have to know what your exit strategy is, and that depends on your resources and so forth and so on. Um, but there's, there really is just no right answer to this. It's a horrible situation. Um, but I wouldn't definitively do it. 
but I wouldn't fully rule it out either, especially if, you know, as you said, there is a surgeon on call. Yeah. And so I would seriously consider it, especially if I saw a tamponade. Yeah. I think 96% of people in the chat said they've never done a solo thoracotomy. Um, I think that's probably incredibly representative yeah, of the population. <laughs> I hope I know uh, you do. That would be nice. <laughs> yeah, because like even, in, you know, like even at county where, I mean, we, w in my opinion, way over thoracotomized patients, like isolated blunt head trauma, correct. <laughs> <Yeah. me. laughs> uh, county, no. it's like, you're going to sew throat thoracotomy. Come on. <laughs> oh, we can just I got a trade. Yeah. I got a trade. The I throat gotta... bones connected to the chest bone. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I heard. Which I will say the other side of it, like if you talk to the amazing trauma faculty there, like when you have the resources, like the amount of a miracle saves that we also have you go to trauma survivor day yeah. and it's like oh my god i saw you in the sick you you were like it's you like know, a humpty dumpty and now you're over here like laughing about a barbecue you're going to yeah, holy it's trauma amazing. survival days are amazing it's like a taylor swift concert there's like <laughs> thousands of people like where did you all come from <laughs> It's true. It's true. And, you know, so I think uh, knowing that, um, you know, and even at a center that does a lot of thoracotomies, I've never been part of one that wasn't like a, a NASCAR pit crew sport where you have all those hands. Um, but in order to even approach the ethical decision of doing the procedure, you have to feel comfortable with it. Um, Jess Mason just put out, which I think will be like the the thoracotomy video of thoracotomy videos, like combining you know, real footage, simulated footage that we have. I highly recommend everyone check it out um, if you haven't seen it yet. Um, because talk about doing a skill that you haven't done in a while, like a thoracotomy, like once you leave residency, like maybe never again, but you need to know how to do it. It's not that complicated when you get into it. Um, and she did that with uh, Kenji, was uh, the consultant on that. And I can tell you a terrible thoracotomy story. Um, we were at County and this person had a machete just shoved through their chest. And um, we did the thoracotomy and um, just as we opened the chest and half the heart fell onto the floor, oh. basically, Kenji goes, I can't fix that. <laughs> <laughs> he can fix a lot. <laughs> can't fix that. Not magic after all. <laughs> well, let's move on to our last ethics case. Um, all right. So now on the flip side, you've got an 85 year old person coming from a skilled nursing care facility. They have a history of dementia. They have no end of life goals of care documentation they arrested in the sniff it was an unwitnessed arrest paramedics worked the patient in the field had a brief period of rosk transport him to you and now they're in a systole they're in arrest again like right when they hit the door what are you doing for that patient are you continuing the code are you calling it how, how do you guys feel about it let's maybe mel start with you this time since you got dibs on last um i can tell you that my practice in my career changed remarkably when it came to this kind of patient and maybe that's just because you're old and you don't care at the, anymore at the end I don't know or you just sort of gain perspective but at the beginning of my career I'd do everything I'm doing it I'll crack and chest I'll do everything for this old lady I'll make her suffer uh, before mm -hmm. she goes to see the golden angels um, uh, then at the end of my career I was aggressively not resuscitating anybody um, and this person I would not resuscitate and uh, you have to be I think at a place where you're senior, you're well known to have everybody on board. It's like, does anybody want their grandmother to be resuscitated in this case? Nope. Okay, so we're not doing anything. You also have to be prepared to have family members come and say, what did you do? Um, I did exactly what I thought was the right thing, which was nothing. People are terrified in this country of be being sued. My 88-year-old grandmother with metastatic cancer who comes in and arrested and you didn't do stuff? I'm going to sue you. I'm like, uh, for what? Lost lives, years of productive life? What, what it, this isn't going to go anywhere. Nobody's going to take this lawsuit. And um, the times that I've done this and stopped resuscitations, and one I remember really well from a family that wanted everything done, and uh, they were screaming at people, and I came on to shift, and um, it was a very similar case. It was a demented patient who had cancer, and everything must be done, and the family is in there, and they're crying, and they're praying over this person, and they're going crazy. And I just walked in and I'm like, we're stopping the resuscitation. This is, uh, we've just, there's no chance here. It's the wrong thing. Initially, the reaction was, um, we're going to sue you. Um, took a swing at me. And I'm like, it's over. It's over. And then there was tears and thank yous, like within 30 seconds. Like, we just couldn't let grandma go. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, it's just, that it changed through my career. And I think you don't have to feel like you can be at that stage part at the beginning you're going to do lots of resuscitations that at the end of your career i think you're just more comfortable saying 
I know where this is going to go. I know this isn't the right thing to do. And I'm comfortable enough at this stage of my career to say, we're not doing it. Yeah. Very different in pediatrics and other stuff. But when uh, the disease has presented itself as the end point of the disease, I'm just comfortable to say, this is the end point. It, just because you have an American citizenship doesn't mean that you should have CPR, epinephrine, and an ICU stay before you die. Sometimes you can just die. Yeah. And I, I think it's interesting you saying that towards the end of your career, you can maybe be more aggressive like that. And, and people, like maybe you've worked at the hospital for years and people know you. I'm thinking about this from being at the beginning of my career. And I, I totally agree with calling this code and not letting this resuscitation go on forever. And I don't think it actually, I mean, they've already, it doesn't matter if they have a DNR or not, like they've already started CPR on this person. We're already down this road now, right? And people are invested and in shocking this person or resuscitating them and doing chest compressions. And so you already have a huge team of people that are now working on this dead body. Like that's very heavy and emotional for people. So for me, and I actually just almost had this exact same person two days ago. Um, I get them onto our gurney. I get them onto our monitor. I We've already started the CPR. I will do another couple rounds. I will look for anything reversible. There's probably not going to be that big AV fistula thing that could potentially be hyper K, you know. But for the most part, I'll do that. I'll try to get family if they're following in the paramedic with the paramedics or right behind. Um, and I talk to my team um, because you've, you, we can't just start have somebody come in and CPR and be like everyone stop you know that's that's not going to work you have to do a couple rounds you have to get the person onto your monitor and then I communicate with the team I look at every single person I don't care if you're a tech uh, and whatever nurse charge nurse a person that was just walking by I look at everyone to make sure like I summarize what we've done I summarize the situation and make sure everyone feels comfortable and then we can call it um, that's personally my technique with every code that I call um, but I think there's no need to aggressively resuscitate this person. I think we can all agree on that. Um, but I think there is technique to doing that with your team, talking to your team, and kind of respecting the end of life for this person. I think the other thing to keep in mind is it's not just do they survive or do they die? I mean, like that's, I think, how families often see it. And I think in the moment how we sometimes see it, but in reality, even if we get Rask on this person, the chances that they're going to make it through and go back home and go back to their life are almost yeah. none. I mean, best case scenario, this person ends up traked and pegged in an LTAC somewhere. And so I think when you think about it, not just like, can I get ROSC? Maybe you can get ROSC, but that is actually not really the point. And what I would probably do, um, because I do think you get more comfortable with this as you go, but to me, what made me really comfortable with it was seeing what happens to these patients in the ICU. Mm -hmm. And I would never want that for myself, certainly. But I think the other, context is what do we offer and what don't we and if we sort of ethically take the extreme example of would you offer this person ECMO well no no one's gonna no do one's gonna ECMO do, on right, this no person one, absolutely <laughs> but why is it because we technically can't we could we absolutely could it's futile. there's all kinds of things that we could do but why is it that ECMO is on this side of the line and doing more chest compressions is on the other side of the line I mean is the question and so I think to me it's I am not going to offer a therapy that I think is futile. We make some arbitrary distinctions about what that is. But again, I think, you know, are we going to offer this person? Let's say that we did get ROSC. Would we offer them a heart transplant if they were in heart failure? Well, no, not because we couldn't technically do it, but because it wouldn't make sense to offer that. So what I would probably do is get them onto my gurney because I think it's very jarring for people okay. until they're on my gurney. Nobody knows who's in charge. EMS is trying to give sign out. So I would just be like, continue chest compressions. I would get them on my gurney at the first pulse check. If there was no pulse, I would just say, all right, this patient doesn't have pulses. Unlikely to have a good outcome. I'm calling time of death. Yeah, I think that's a really great points from everybody. I think the idea of medical futility is super important. And, you know, we all live in practice in the state of California, which it's like a legally protected entity. In Texas, that's also the same. We have like a citation. The difficulty of defining medical futility, like ethicists and other scholars still have a hard time because like what we kind of know to be medically futile, sometimes we're wrong about. Again, there's those miracle cases, but it's also hard to define like what is futile sometimes because, you know, everyone has a different perception of quality of life, which I understand. But I mean, those I call those people, which is like probably not a great phrase, like tile gazers, folks that are just like left in an LTAC somewhere where their existence, whatever level of consciousness they have, are just looking at a tile on a ceiling all day. And 
the public doesn't see that. They don't get to walk those words. They don't get to understand that. In my opinion, there are fates far worse than death mm -hmm. in this world. Um, and I think certainly throughout training, you experience that. And I do think it's our part of our sacred role as being healthcare providers is to steward people towards decisions that like they don't have wisdom about or decide, um, have the ability to decide. Yeah, you know? I mean, to, Mel, to Mel's point, it's that they, to ask someone, is it okay? You can't ask a family member, like, is it okay if I call the code now? Because then they're deciding that their grandma yeah. dies. Like, yeah. you can't put that on a family mm -hmm. member. Even as a physician, if you did that to my mom or me, I, like, I can't make that decision for you. I need somebody to decide when this is futile and no longer going to get us anywhere. And so when you take that off the family and then they're crying, like, that, that is relieving to yes. them. And they... You know, to you don't have that time to be like, do they want to be traked and pegged? And they, they just keep them alive. Do what you need to keep them alive. Of course, that's what they want you to do, because they can't also say, no, I'm okay with them being dead now. Yeah, and I think there's an important part of that. That's part of the ritual of dying, and honestly, the performance of CPR and having a healthcare experience at the end of life, for better or for worse, has become part, at least in the United States, of the ritual of death. And so I think, like to your guys' points of like, I transfer them to the gurney, like. That's an important consideration. It sounds like we're getting we're getting a sign here. We're getting a <laughs> everything's falling. Yeah. God is about to smite us for yeah. whatever you just said. <laughs> the fire alarm oh, has the building is on fire. To burn it now. <laughs> but um, you know, I think it is an important part of that that ritual. Um, and you know, I think there's part of that ritual. It's important for family members to see and to experience. And there's also a part of that ritual that's important for healthcare providers to feel comfortable in the care that they've provided to the patient. Um, this my, is all EL's fault. Yeah, well, I mean, there's actually a study in the New England Journal yes. from like 2015 that's like, w they asked the public like, hey, how often do you think people walk out of the hospital from CPR? Right. And they're like, oh, 60% of the time. And they oh looked gosh. at like the entire <laughs> anthology of like Scrubs, ER. And they were like, well, how often do they walk out on these shows? And they're like, oh, it's like 65% of the time. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so TV has really made people think that uh, CPR is some magic thing and ICU is some magic thing. I always tell people, I'm sorry, Sarah, but nobody comes out of the ICU better than the way they went in. <laughs> okay, so if true. you're a demented with <laughs> terrible disease and you're going to die in five minutes, just because Sarah can keep you alive for a few days. It's, you're not going back to you know twiddle and play guitar. So it really is the perception of the uh, public that's the problem, and it's television. And, yeah. it, and that study was really profound. And actually, when that study came out and ER was on, there was a study before that one, um, we started making people die on ER. It's so like Joe Sexy was writing. I'm like, Joe, you need to make start doing CPR and have people die because this is ridiculous. What we're making people believe is stupid. So uh, it is a problem. People really think that CPR is magic. If you're getting CPR, yeah, things aren't going well. Yeah, totally. And you know, and I think the other the other component of it, um, addressing this, like I'm certainly early in my career, and I it's my practice to not resuscitate this patient. And I found meeting with the team beforehand and being like, listen. Uh, we're going to see what this patient looks like. We're going to see their story. If it's really all these poor prognostic factors, if we don't have a pulse at the first pulse check, I'm just going to call it. Is everyone okay with that? And the amount of relief that you also mm -hmm. get from the team, mm -hmm. like, oh, thank God. Like, because nobody likes running that cardiac arrest. No, everybody in that room knows you're not doing a service to the patient. Um, you're basically just benefiting a health insurance company that's going to bill for all of this later, right? If but you have this circumstance, or if you have this circumstance where you're running a code and in your mind you're going, oh my God, I hope we don't get this person back, you know it's time to not run that code. Yeah. And I know we've all had that feeling. Like, we're doing mm -hmm. this thing because we're going through the motion. We're like, oh, please do not get a pulse. Well, great. Well, on that on uplifting note, <laughs> <laughs> this has been a great discussion, guys. Thanks. I hope we're all still friends at the end of this. Yeah. I think we had a lot more agreement than disagreement. A little disappointing, we'll I guess. We'll try harder you next know? time. Yeah, try. <laughs> Come on. Oh. Uh, well, thank you guys so much for listening to us this evening and joining us on our Grand Rounds. We have our next one. It's the first Wednesday of every month. And if I had a calendar in my head, I can say exactly when that is in October. But the first... October 4th? 4th? Is it 4th? The first Wednesday <laughs> yeah, of October, October 4th, will be our next one. That'll be an urgent care focused Grand Rounds. Please, as always, like, subscribe, hit the little bell down below so you know when these fun events Please happen. Please say doobly doo. Doobly doo. <laughs> it's in the doobly doo. It's right down <laughs> below me, right there. I can't do it with this mic stand. It's like right, right hanging out down there. And obviously, uh, thank you guys all for being here, for helping us put it on. But also, thanks to the incredible production team that you don't get to see in front of the camera, all their beautiful faces for all the hard work that goes into getting these things, getting us looking this good, sounding this good. They do an incredible amount of work, and uh, it wouldn't be possible without them. I just think that we should go to the wide shot for a second because you always see Tom and other people, but 
This oh, guy over here guy? is an emergency medicine registrar in Australia, <laughs> and he's also a cameraman. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's, how, that's the level of production. Everybody behind that you can't see is board certified in our specialty, mostly emergency medicine. <laughs> it's crazy. That's where it's all the place. rheumatologists have gone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank Amazing. you guys so much for joining us. Have a great night. See you next time.